sacrifice. Uh, there's a lot of correlation here that we see in this passage with the Old Testament. Let me just give you a, a brief summary. In the Old Testament, uh, the author that's writing this is Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's writing it up under the, the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is God-breathed, we know. But he's actually the one that's penning this. And we know that he was a Hebrew among Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the sacrificial system uh, that was involved in the Old Testament. There were several different types of sacrifices that were presented in the Old Testament. Let me give you just a few of those. There was a burnt offering. There was a grain offering. There was a peace offering. And all of these offerings were voluntary acts of worship. Okay, they presented these offerings as a voluntary act of worship. It was a, a, a means by which they worship uh, the God of all creation. There was also a sin offering and a guilt offering, and these two were mandatory atonement for sin. They were required to do this for the sin in which they had committed. God gave certain requirements concerning the, the sacrificial system and expected individuals to follow these instructions that he gave. Now, aren't you thankful that we don't live under the Old Testament law anymore? That we don't have to go out and make a sacrifice. I'm not alive today, so I've got to go out and like make a sacrifice, like slay an animal and like have blood everywhere because of my sin, right? No, we don't have to do that. And the reason we don't have to do that is because of Jesus. Jesus is the one. Write this verse down. Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 14. Now, let me read that for you. Hebrews 10... 11 through 14, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for, one, uh, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, that is Jesus, since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The sacrificial system was done away with when Jesus shed his blood for our sins. Our sins past, our sins present, and our sins future. And instead of us having to go sacrifice an animal, all we have to do according to what the Bible says is if we confess our sins, then He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. I'm thankful that we don't have to, to shed blood for the sins which you and I commit. So we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're to present ourselves wholly acceptable to God, which is... Our reasonable service. Okay, so the first part we see is that, pull that up for me if you will. The first part is that we are to offer or present our bodies to God. That's the first commitment that's involved. All right, secondly, there's a commitment that involves service. Look at the latter part of verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Here we go which is your reasonable service. Once you've committed yourself, once you've offered yourself, once you've offered your body, you must also commit your life and yourself to service. Now, understand this before we go any further. We do not work to obtain salvation. You got that? We do not do all these works, and by doing all these works, we'll be saved. That's not how this works. That's not what it's speaking out here. All right? We're saved by grace through faith, and because we have been saved, we should perform good works. You see that? So we're not knocking on people's doors, and we're not doing all this service work so that we'll get to heaven. We're doing this because of what God has done in our life. I mean, He's changed our life. He saved us from hell. He, he's put us on a completely different path. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Have become, are becoming, are daily becoming new for the one who has trusted Christ. So we see that there's a commitment here that involves service. 
everything we have, everything that we are is to be presented to God, that is a, a, a great summary of our reasonable service. And I can't answer the question for you tonight if, if, if you're serving the Lord as you should. You have to do that yourself. You have to examine your own heart. You have to examine your own life and see just what type of service uh, you're involved in. How are you serving the Lord? Once you trust Jesus as Savior, He's given every believer different gifts to be used for Him. And we don't have time tonight to look at all the different spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the Bible, but if you've trusted Jesus, He's given you one. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, am I committed to using this gift that God has given me for His glory? Am I committed to service? How are we to do this? How is this to be done? By living your life for God? By being controlled by the Holy Spirit and not yourself? By putting God above everything else. Well, we've taken God out of this compartment that we, that we used to put Him in. I know I used to do that. God was in this compartment and on, on Sundays I'd pull Him out and I'd say, Well, today's Sunday. Got my Bible going to church. Look all spiritual. Dress nice with my tie. I got my Bible. Got your Bible? Okay. Wednesday. I'd reach in and grab my, my Bible out of my compartment. Off to church I would go. Spiritual, right? So what we're doing is when we commit ourselves to Jesus, we're, we're doing away with that whole system where we compartment, uh, put these things in compartments. We're putting God first and foremost in everything. In everything that we do. And we're living our lives for Him. We're putting Him first. We're being grounded in our faith. And that's a question, again, you'll have to ask yourself. Are you grounded in your faith? That's one of the whole ideas behind the 12 for 1 vision is that we, as disciples, be grounded in our faith. Here's the sad fact. And I've been there. I've been there before, so I can speak concerning this. There were times when I, I was literally terrified of someone coming up and asking me, you know, how is Jesus different from all these other religions? I mean, you got Judaism and Mormonism and uh, Jehovah's Witness. How's, how's Christianity any different from that? How would you answer that if somebody asked you that today? Think about that. If someone came up to you and said, hey, why, why do I need to follow Jesus? Why can't I follow one of these other religions? I mean, all religions lead to heaven, right? Yeah. And before long, you'll be sitting there going, if you're not grounded and rooted in your faith. That's why when teenagers graduate from high school and leave home, 75% of them that were involved in church never return to the church. They walk away as a senior in high school, and they never go back again. And when they get out into college, on the campuses of universities right around us, there's Mormons and Jehovah's Witness saying, hey, you need to believe this. Read this. Come sit down with me. And if you are rooted and grounded in your faith, when you encounter that at a secular university, you'll know exactly what to say. You'll have the Holy Spirit that will lead you and guide you and direct you. You will have studied God's Word and you will know the Word of God. If you commit yourself to following Him, Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Word of God. The Word of God. We must commit ourselves to service. These are just a few areas, just a few ways that you can go about doing that. Yes, it's important to be involved in, in our small group Bible studies, which we do here on Sundays. Yes, it's important for you to be involved here on Wednesday nights because this is a, a way for you to grow, not just because you're standing up here listening to me teach, but because we, we've prayed and we've uh, sought God's guidance and direction, and we're praying that His Word, not my, not my voice, but His Word will speak to your hearts tonight and to my heart and penetrate our hearts and draw us unto Him. So these things are necessary. These are just a few of the ways that we commit ourselves to service, to serving and following God. And as I've mentioned, it's a lifelong commitment. The whole process that you've heard me speak out before called sanctification, that is when you trust Jesus as Savior, 
once you've uh, been regenerated, you've been justified, you've been made right with God, okay, then begins the process of sanctification. That's a lifelong process where daily you're working, uh, you're, you're, you're striving to grow in your faith, to become more like Jesus, so that you can say daily, may Jesus increase, may Brad decrease. May Jesus increase, fill your name in the blank. May, may I decrease. Are we committed to service, to presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, striving for holiness, using the gifts and the talents that God's given us, and are we doing these things that are acceptable and pleasing to God? Remember, this is an obligation. This is expected of the Christian. This is expected from the Christian. So we see first that we must make a commitment, and the commitment involves an offer to present our bodies. The commitment also involves service. But look thirdly, the commitment involves transformation. Look at verse 2. The Bible says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You must be willing to change. How many of you like change? Change might be a dirty word also as well, right? A lot of people get, get rooted in something or, 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 or have a pattern that they follow, and they don't like to change things. I mean, you've got your class schedule at school. You don't want to change next semester and do something different. You've got your lunch period that you like. I was talking to a student this week that was telling me about that. I don't want change. I, you know, I had this lunch period before. So we don't like change many times. Uh, humans are, are creatures of habit. And change involves us not being conformed to this world in which you and I live. And this world, whether you know it or not, is bombarding you daily, moment by moment, with crap, garbage, junk that does not edify God, that does not build up the kingdom of God. I mean, you can flip on regular... TV used to be the rabbit ears. Now it's the little digital cable box that's free, and you see all sorts of garbage on there that you don't need to be a part of. I mean, you can practically see pornography on that type of box. Those are things that are not pleasing to God. So change involves uh, not being conformed to this world. I remember in high school, now this goes back many years ago. Some of you are probably going to say, man, what in the world was that? During my day in high school, parachute pants were the thing. <laughs> they were like the coolest thing. And everybody had parachute pants. So what did I want? I got to have a pair of parachute pants, right? I mean, like everybody's got them. Everybody's got them. Everybody's wearing them to school. Miss Kelly probably even had some parachute pants. But, 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 but. We, we, we wanted them because everybody had them. And that's the same type of mentality that we have today. Just because everybody else is doing it, we want to do it too. No, the Bible says not to be conformed to the things of this world. Not to be involved with the things of this world, but to be transformed. So change involves not being conformed to the world, but change also involves transformation. How many of you have seen Transformers? Transformers growing up as a kid, not the movies that just came out, but the old cartoon with the little Bumblebee character was like the coolest thing. I mean, he would be like a dude, and then like the next second he would be like a little yellow bug that was zooming around. That was like the coolest thing. You remember their, uh, their slogan or their saying, Transformers more than meets the eye, right? More than meets the eye. Likewise, we are to be transformed uh, in a very similar manner. Transform or transformation takes place by the renewing of your mind. This is a daily, daily, moment by moment process. Transformation. We don't become transformed totally overnight. We don't transform from that, that uh, car to that man overnight. Likewise, we don't transform from our old sinful fallen person to the new person that we are in Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. 